he was out of the bedroom, I'd sneak in the bedroom and pick the weights up and do a couple of curls and see what happens to the thing. Go put this this protein powder in a, in a pint pot and try and mix it up and it didn't mix at all and you have to kind of gulp it down. Zach Khan was in my class. Right. So thinking about a second show, he stood next to Zach Khan and you're thinking, yeah, I probably, probably need a little bit more time uh, time to get into to all of this. I was so pissed off with the second guy. I was furious mm -hmm. and outwardly calm, but I internally, like he lit a fire in me, like a nuclear level fire where I was like, I am going to wipe this guy out so people today we are joined with charlie Marden, um founder of ultraflex gym i'm sure you know who they are and venture capitalist how are you doing charlie yeah really good yeah looking forward to this i, I don't do it very often if at all so it's um fun to, to be doing and uh, obviously when you reached out it was, it was a pleasure to get something booked in well to be honest i use your gyms uh up and down the country mm. phenomenal places um and i looked online before i did this and i thought has charlie did anything online i couldn't find any podcasts or anything so hopefully i'm the first proper podcast yeah. to uh to do something and um, so obviously for people who are watching and listening they don't know everything about you yeah. um people might have seen you in and around the gyms and stuff um how did your sort of journey begin specifically with the gyms uh, i suppose it's really f from being a gym enthusiast you know i used gyms for a long time I, I trained for over 25 years competed for for 15 of those years and I'd used gyms all over the country, all over the world, traveling or either with competing or just with other businesses that I was involved in. And so I came at it from a point of an enthusiast. You know, I, I love I love being in the gyms. Uh, you know, I was passionate about about the competing, uh, but also about the training in particular. And so it was really an evolution of being in the gym. And I'm sure you'll do. You say, "Oh, it'd be really good if they had this," or "Wouldn't it be great if they did that?" Right. Or if this was my gym, I would have this there, or I would move that from there to there. And then uh, talking to my training partners about it for a number of years. Uh, and then really uh, getting to the point where actually I, I was in a position where I thought, well, actually, I could possibly do this. And I knew a couple of gyms that were for sale. Uh, and so th those became kind of that, that kind of started the interest and thinking, oh, no, I'm busy with other things. I won't do it. But then going, actually, no, I should do it. And um, having that moment where you think, uh, right, OK, how would it look? And actually, that could be quite exciting. Uh, and it, the, the start of it was not being able to find someone really high level. You know, Leeds is a big place. Uh, but there were some good gyms, but there was nothing really exceptional. But I would travel to different parts of the world with, with business and think, oh, if we had a gym like this at home, it'd be amazing. It would be absolutely packed. Mm -hmm. And then thinking, well, there must be other people who feel the same as me. And, and then look, maybe we should should do this as well. So where are you actually from? And what were you doing before the bodybuilding, before you get in, got into the comp, com, uh, competing and stuff like that? Like, what's your, what was your journey up to that point? Oh, I mean, I got into bodybuilding pretty early on, kind of 15, really, was when I started right. lifting weights. But I'd been doing other sports running, uh, swimming competitively, playing racket sports, other things like that as well. Um, and as much as I wanted to be good at those things, I found I was terrible at long distance running, but my, my genetics were much better for, for, for bodybuilding. So as soon as I started training, I, I grew pretty quickly. And, and I realized that was probably where, even though my, kind of my ambitions were elsewhere at the time, that was where my talents lay. So I got more into the bodybuilding and then, and then the rest went from, from there. So what was your upbringing like up until that point though? Did you did you come from a family of bodybuilders? No, so I mean, my family were involved in bodybuilding. Uh, I suppose part of the reason I got into it was uh, my dad had a big operation, a heart and lung transplant, which is a massive one. Right. And after the operation, because of the condition he'd had prior to that, he um, he'd lost a lot of muscle tissue, and he hadn't he'd, and hadn't been able to be active because he had something called primary pulmonary hypertension. And so uh, he was quite keen on being able to exercise again because his heart hadn't been, uh, been up to it because of the condition once he had the heart and lung transplant. So as part of the rehabilitation, they gave him these metal can uh, kind of insure drinks. Right. And, they, and they said to him, I remember him explaining this to me, oh, I have to drink this drink. It's got protein in it. I mean, it was terrible. It was like milk powder and sugar, but uh, it tasted pretty good. Uh -huh. uh, and he had these these drinks and they said, look, you need to he gave him a set of weights. You need to lift the weights and drink these drinks and your muscles will grow. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking as a kid, well, isn't that great? You know, I just want to do some of that. So when he was out of the bedroom, I'd sneak in the bedroom and pick the weights up and do a couple of curls and see what happens sort of thing. Um, and so that was really the first time I got introduced to, to kind of the concept of it. And like a lot of 80s kids, you know, watching the Stallone movies, the Schwarzenegger movies, all that sort of stuff, you look at these guys and think, oh, yeah, that's what I saw. they look the business. I want to look like that when I'm, you know, when I'm uh, older. Uh, so I got into a little bit of training from that bought my first weight set which was just a, a bench a barbell and some dumbbells for my bedroom and my bedroom was literally a bed and a bench uh and a desk for me to work on that's why i used to tra that's how i started training in, right, in there lifting that listening to the top gun soundtrack rocky four soundtrack <laughs> all the all the all the sort of good stuff and um 
And then I remember, you know, at that time, this was way before bodybuilding was, was, was kind of more popular. The only place you could really buy protein powder was Argos. So ordering mm -hmm. like Joe White, wider uh, milk and egg protein, box oh, yeah. of six of those. But then um, my mom not being so keen on pro the protein powder because I appreciate for her, she was just thinking, why can't I just eat normal food? So I have to wait till she left the house go put this this protein powder in a, in a pint pot and try and mix it up and it didn't mix at all and you have to kind of gulp it down. Um, and and, um, and that was really the beginnings of, of getting into training. And what age were you at this time? Oh, uh, that must have been about 14, 15, something like that. Did, yeah. did your friends and stuff train as well or was it just you? No, I mean, we had a, there was a gym at the school I went to, uh, but it was relatively small and we, so as part of our PE, we'd have one session a week in the gym where we do basically do a circuit. But but no one was particularly into into training at that time. I had a friend of mine called um, Adam. He was he had a few weight sets at his house, and his his dad used to kind of tell us about how to do some curls and stuff. But nothing nothing serious really. So if you take us through that, then so you're training your 14, 15 year old. Obviously, you're getting some results and stuff. Then new begins when you first yeah. start drinking whatever kind of shit mix you've got at the time. <laughs> um, when did you start thinking about actually? Do you know what I could compete here? Was it something where people said, Charlie, you, you look you're looking good? Or did you know, I, I think I've got something here? Yeah, really, well, I suppose when I got into my late teens, early 20s, I put a lot of weight on in a short space of time. So by the time I was 18, I was 18 stone. I was 19 stone at 19, so I got kind of bigger. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a solid 19 stone, put it that way. There was a bit of water and fat with it. But um, I suppose people start to know your physique and say, like, have you ever thought about competing? And I'd go to some of the gyms in around Leeds and people who competed were there. And I, at the time, I never really paid much attention, but a friend of mine uh, called James, he went to compete at a local show. I'd been training with him, so I went on to watch him do that and help support him. And then obviously, the more you spend time around it, the more you think, actually, you know, maybe I could give this a go and, and so mm -hmm. on as well. So did, can you remember the, the, the moment when you actually thought, I am going to compete and this is the show I'm going to book myself in for? And do you remember that? Or was yeah. it your friend saying, Charlie, go on, you've got to give this a go? Or? Yeah, I suppose I, originally I was going to do a show in 2003, giving away my age here. And... Um, uh, I ended up not doing a show because I got really sick with something called compiler back to which is you get from un uh, undercooked chicken. Right. Uh, it was self-inflicted because I was trying to... Sh 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 um, all the gains, yeah, well, <laughs> it definitely didn't get any gains. I was, I was in bed for about three weeks. I lost about three stone. No, no joking. Either. Really? Really, really bad. And so it was more of a diet than I probably wanted to do <laughs> at that period right. of time. So I ended up not doing that going forward and doing my first show in 2004. Um, and I did a couple of shows that year, but the first show I did was against a guy called Dave Titterton, who was um, in my class. In a, I went straight into do class one as a, as a um, in a, a UK competition. Uh, he was a very good guy. He went on to become Mister Universe. So that was my first show. My second show was again. Uh, I, can't, I was in the class ones again as a, as a, a Mister England as a Universe qualifier. And Zach, I was talking to him actually about this the other day. And Zach Khan was in my class. Right. So thinking about right, second show, you stood next to Zach Khan, and you're thinking, yeah, I probably, probably need a little bit more time oh, uh, no, no. time to get into to all of this. So I took a few years out, concentrated on on work and business, and then and then came back and, and started competing again. So that's something I want to look at as well. I mean, as you were when you were 14 year old and you were you know you were started training and things like that, what were, what were you kind of doing as you started going into the competing world and all that type of stuff? What were you doing for work? What were you doing for business? Because obviously, yeah. we will get onto you know the fact that where you are now and, and the success you've had. But where did that all begin? Like because not everyone who's bodybuilding mm. is also business minded as well. So yeah. where did that come from? I started off. I mean, I was I was my I did a degree in sport and exercise science. Um, so I was because I was so passionate about it. I thought I studied something that I was interested in. Um, I also worked briefly as a PT. I just didn't, uh, I enjoyed it for a little bit, but some clients you could really help and you could show them how to progress. Other clients basically just wanted to pay you to do the work for them, which it didn't quite yeah. work that way and, and, and really didn't want to be there. They just kind of wanted you to drag them around. Um, so I did that for a short period of time, but then I got into financial services. I went to work for a bank uh, called First Direct, a big local employer in Leeds. Um, and I started off working in a call center. Uh, it wasn't a particularly glamorous work. It was nine and a half grand a year, uh, full-time yeah. salary. But it was a start, and they were a company who did some, they provided some really excellent training, and there was some career progression there. Mm -hmm. So I started off working there, but then started to get some qualifications and worked my way up through that business, uh, and then subsequently went into other. So I've always worked from, from that point forward in, in financial services. So how, how high did you get in that company? Did you work, how, when you said you sort of yeah. progressed through it? Well, I, I, I progressed to, to a, what they called a level five, which was a, a sales coach and a coach of coaches. Um, but that was as far as I went with that particular business. I, I'd taken the qualifications to be able to be a uh, financial planner, but I couldn't uh, get a role there because that, that part of the business was contracting. So I, le I left and went to work for a company called Halifax uh, and right. was an advisor with them for a couple of years. Uh, and they just had, you know, they had a great setup. And, and where was your system. bodybuilding career at this point? So this was the point where I was starting to compete. 
Um, but I always, um, I mean, part of the old 90s kind of thing was that you you didn't, you know, you didn't work, you bodybuilded full time. Yeah. And you went and kind of sat on Venice Beach and, and you know, lapped up the rays and then you went and did your gym session, and had a nap and, and that was your day, which is, sounds great. But I was very well aware that I needed to have a backup plan in case my, my goals of being Mr. Olympia didn't quite work out. Uh, yeah, and also from the people I'd seen in gyms, you could see the pressure that financial stress put on people. You know, you said it, <laughs> for me at that stage, it wasn't a, um, a cheap thing to do. You know, I was, I started off eating tins of tuna, uh, <laughs> just, just draining those and eating them. But, but I kind of, I wanted to upgrade from tuna to chicken, you know, so, uh, so I knew I needed a good job to be able to pay for it and also not to be reliant on working in gyms or doing other things in order to, to kind of fund my competitions. And at this stage, did you still live at home? No, no, so I left home when I was 18. Right, um, okay. Yeah, so, um, so I was living in, in shared houses in Leeds with, with some of the guys uh, that I knew. Because obviously we're down at the, the Marden family office, aren't yeah. we, today? Um, and it's a wonderful place, great place to, you know, there's plenty of offices and stuff. You've got a few around here, haven't you? Yeah. Um, but because we're sitting in here now, not everyone's going to understand kind of, you've worked obviously, you know, in that industry. When do you kind of break off and think, actually, I want to start doing something for myself now? When was that kind of a thing? Um, I broke off in 2007, so that's when I started to, to work for myself right. and, and set up my own business. Actually, um, that's a lot later than I thought, to be fair. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I'm what would I've been about then about 27 years old. Right. Uh, I think part of the thing these days in the fallacy is that, you know, if you haven't become some sort of tech billionaire by the time you're 21, somehow <laughs> you failed in life. You know, that's not the case at all. Uh, and you know, my advice to anyone starting out would be generally to get a lot of experience and knowledge under your belt working for someone else who can really, you know, can learn and train and progress. Yeah, and then And then set up on your own. Setting out on your own before you've kind of really done much elsewhere is, is a tough thing to do. And you might as well learn and develop on someone else's money uh, and then and then just kind of reach out on your own. But yeah, so I started at 27 because at, at that point I felt like I was ready to, to do something a bit, bit, bit different. So what is it you actually do now? Like what is, because I, I kind of know, yeah. but for the people listening or watching, what is it that you actually do to make to make a living yes, without uh, the gyms? Yeah, so it's, so it's a mixture of um, investments in financial services businesses, property development and rentals and leisure and health businesses. Right, so okay. my job is to invest into those businesses, help you know manage and mentor those people who are running the businesses uh, to help them grow um, but then obviously to develop those and, and build up the value and the, the profit in those businesses as well so what was your first kind of venture or first attempt at business when you kind of left the whole the corporate world the, the first thing was was running a wealth management business so looking after people's investments and pensions primarily helping how did you plan. how did you start that though that's that's the uh, thing like so well i was already doing that that kind of role working for halifax bank yeah uh, and it was really just an evolution of moving from that to actually running the business myself rather than working for a, a firm doing that so that's what i meant by you know right, they, they okay. gave me a yeah, lot yeah. of training and development there was a great it was a great company as was first direct to, to learn in but yeah. then once you'd kind of figured out how the whole thing works was okay well how can i just adapt this and do this for myself mm -hmm. but also be able to offer you know, really great long-term relationships with my clients where it wasn't like I was going to get moved around the bank in different roles. I could say to them, well, actually, look, I'm going to be your wealth manager for the next 10 or 20 years or how long you, you want me in and, yeah, and so of on course. as well. So. Can you remember getting your first client though, or was it a case of actually, well, I've got existing clients here, I'm going to just effectively use the rapport we've built to try and move them over? Yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, some of the existing clients I had followed me when I set up my own business. Uh, I had to be very careful with some of the, the kind of legalities around, of around that. But uh, from that point of view, I got some great advice early on, which is which if you do a great job for your clients, you really look out after and and, you, and some of the basic stuff just do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it you will not struggle to attract other further further clients as well so then i get recommendations to speak to the friends family and colleagues mm -hmm. um and build the business for, out from there do you know what's mad you say that about just doing what you said you were going to do i've noticed that with you personally um that there could have been things i've reached out to you about months ago and you've said, right, we'll do it on this date. And then on that date, you've actually contacted as mm. well. I'm thinking, Can I, I actually forgot about that. And he's mm. still on it. Mm. So that definitely does take you so far. Mm. But in terms of actually growing a successful business, because you've kind of, you, you've, you know, you've made the transition from the corporate world to sort of doing it for yourself. You've built a business. When did you think, actually, do you know what? This is going to be viable. This is going to be very lucrative. And I could, I could scale this. Yeah, so I set up in September of seven, uh, just shortly before the credit crunch in two thousand and eight. So that was a tough time to start start a business. <laughs> what a time uh, it, oh. But in a weird way, it, it really worked because a lot of the clients who were, uh, I had been dealing with, or a lot of people out there, they at that point 
people are much more motivated by fear than they are by pleasure. Yeah. Uh, and so they were really worried about what was happening and they really wanted to speak to someone to understand what they should do. And a lot of their existing um, advisors were, were running for cover and didn't want to have conversations because they thought they were going to get a hard time. So it was a great time. For, I tried to turn that negative into an opportunity and, and, and build off that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, really support them resource them and then remind them look i was there for you when no one else was you know and then, then in the good times you can you can help them and, and really build and grow the wealth and when did you see that then so did you was there a point when you thought actually do you know what like i'm ready now to go into other things because you mentioned that you've got you know you got into property management and, and all that type of stuff mm -hmm. as well um when was that was that just a, i'm oh, doing okay i want to start yeah. investing this money now was there one of the things I, I always talk to my clients about is diversification you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket so but initially, generally, the, the rule is uh, Warren Buffett's rule of concentration of capital, which is if you've got something good, invest in that and build that quicker. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, it was probably a good six or seven years just running one business and focusing purely on that before I then started to branch off and do other things. Yeah. It's very easy to get distracted and end up doing like three or four things initially, mm -hmm. but you want to master one thing and then that becomes the feeder that then can finance and, and give you the skills to then go on and do other things as well. But that it's interesting you say that because similarly to having this podcast, obviously I've got the content page business and I'm kind of now thinking right I know that I want to build that brand so in order to do that I'm speaking to people like yourself mm. and I'm traveling up and down the country um, and overseas and stuff and I'm thinking why not bring these great minds mm. together provide some value ultimately they'll get to know about the content PT mm. what we do da, da, da. Um, and it's kind of so far so good mm. however what I do know is I've always been one of them people who've been spinning a lot of plates and I feel yeah. like that's probably me downfall yeah. when you said there once you've mastered one thing how do you know when you've mastered that thing? You've never truly mastered anything, have you? But where you feel like you've got to a level of proficiency, we'd give yourself a nine out of 10 uh, with it. And you probably know because um, you've got more clients than you want. Uh, you're able to be selective in terms of who you work with. Yeah. Financially, you're seeing the rewards of, of, of doing that. And then that's the point where you think, actually, okay. And, and, and primary, another big factor is having a good group of people working with you where they could run the business if you fell over tomorrow. Um, because until you've got a team, actually, the business is entirely you. Whereas at that point, I felt like I had a good team that could run the business day to day. And that allowed me to free up some time to then do other things with my time as well. So how did you go about pulling in the right staff? Because I know that's a, that's something that a lot of people face with getting the right team. I know myself, it's very hard, um, whether it's like a control thing, but I'll only I'll only, only bring on certain people who I trust. Yeah. Um, like my video guy, Kurt, I, I've known him all my life. Yeah. So it was only right that he's a creative. I bring him in um, because I trust him. But how does it work in terms of you? How did you find the right stuff to help you run this? Well, it was your baby, wasn't it, yeah. at that time? Yeah, it's really hard. And and finding good people and retaining good people is the number one challenge I find with business. If You know, other things are easier. You can buy machines, you can operate certain things, but people are less predictable. Yeah. And also some people can interview you really well and you speak, you know, you think, well, oh, they're going to be fantastic. And they turn out to be terrible. Yeah. Conversely, you've had some people who've, not maybe blowing you away at an interview stage, but when they get in the job, they absolutely fly. So it can be difficult. And really you have to, you, you get better over time at weeding out uh, as many people as possible at the first stages, but ultimately it's just giving people the opportunity and then quickly uh, changing things if, if, if it isn't working as well. See, what, what's mad for me, right, when I, I realise the kind of success and the path that you've went down, how... Like, mm. that's what I ask myself. Like, who's taught you? Who's give you this mindset? Who's mm. give you? Because you've got to be tenacious. You've got to have that kind of thick skin. Yeah. Like, has there ever been times when you thought, I can't fucking do this? Oh, yeah. And you have days where you think, why am I doing this? And I could just go and do X, Y, Z, and so on. But you put, you put yourself up. But that's part of um, any successes. I think if you go into it with a view that I'm likely to fail a lot, but yeah, that's your expectation because the Instagram world tells you that everything's going to be amazing and you're just going to be smashing it out of the park every day of the week. And mm -hmm. it's not the case. So if you go into it with a resilient attitude, which is, no, I know I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm going to learn quickly. I'm not going to do them again. And then as long as I'm making new mistakes and not repeating the old ones, then that's fine. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be progressing in the direction I want. But also I've allowed for the fact that some things just won't work. So, uh, you know, we've we'll talked to people about this with funds. If you get it right seven or eight times out of ten, you're still winning. That's um, enough, isn't uh, it? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's enough to, to get More you More wins there. than losses, effectively. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but having that expectation set, because otherwise th what happens is people try, they fail once, they quit. Uh, and you could say the same with the gym, you know. Yeah, of so, course. So, you know, we're actually, if you go into it knowing, look, I'm going to fail a few times and I'm going to have to be pragmatic and change and I shouldn't be too fixed in my views, but if I keep going, I will get there. So that kind of unrelenting determination and that uh, that attitude of I, I will I will succeed.
I think I think that's a thing. I think uh, you have to fail, though, don't you? You've mm. got you've actually got to experience hardship or failure in some way, shape, or form to to kind of know. Can you drop on a time when you know you've when you know you've failed? Just to provide anyone who's signed listening, and there's a lot of people who I know that are starting up business, have been yeah. in business for a while, but they look at people like yourself and think, you know, Charlie must have failed. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you tell us about a time when you thought actually, you know, this is this is going bad. This. Yeah, and, and I mean, I suppose one example is when I was just trying to get the job in the first place. I, I it took me three interviews to get the job, and part. I think it was a blessing in disguise because the first time they said like I hadn't prepared for the interview properly and I wasn't the most successful uh, most, you know the best candidate so that was on me I should have prepared more thoroughly I should have knew, known all the things that I needed to know for that interview um, but you think okay well rather than go away and think oh that was unfair I think no that's a fair comment I need to improve the second time they just said look there's someone else who was a better candidate for the role um, uh, uh, but I found out from, from the recruitment agent that the, the, the guy who interviewed me actually had an issue with the fact that I had facial hair. So like I had like a stubble really? like I have today. And he said, oh, I should have come to the interview clean shaven. And you think, well, <laughs> oh, it's pretty, wait, that's, it's, it's, no, no, it's, so it's pretty pathetic. It was a pretty quick uh, thing to resolve, isn't it? With five minutes of razor and some, some shaving gel. But anyway, <laughs> it, again, that was a blessing because when I got the job done the third occasion, I really appreciated it. And I didn't take it for granted that I just rolled into the job and, and I got it. But also I was so pissed off with the second guy. I was furious mm -hmm. and outwardly calm, but I internally, like he lit a fire in me, like a nuclear level fire where I was like, I am gonna wipe this guy out. So what I did in my first quarter of sales was I did more sales on my own than his entire team of 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to make the point to him that you made the biggest mistake. And I'm gonna make sure everyone knows the story that you turned me down and that I took a job in a different area where there was a different manager and they all have kind of inter inter region competitions. And then uh, I went on to become the number one salesperson nationally in the company. Um, I wanted everyone to know he was the guy who turned me down and why he turned me down, but also it'd be, to be embarrassing for him because it was so rude the way he did it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I enjoyed uh, seeing, I saw him at a, a kind of national conference I had in Birmingham. And um, I'm not usually as childish as, as this, this story sort of dictates, but it was really motivational for me. <laughs> you and just I, drove through yeah. it in your car. <laughs> and um, because I think sometimes you can use negative yeah, things yeah, as motivation. It doesn't always have to be a positive thing. Actually, I think some, that, 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 that I needed that fire lit in my belly. So I saw him at the national conference where I'd come first, I'd come off the, the stage. And I just smoked him. And I said, not bad for a guy with facial hair, huh? And <laughs> the, 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 that, that was a kind of, that sealed off for me. Now we got on well after that and I didn't hold anything against him. But up until that point, I needed that that drive and I needed that <laughs> I needed that that fire in my belly so sometimes it helps if you have someone who tells you you can't do it or tells you you're not going to make do you it think or, do you think if you do you think if you had social media at the time you would have trolled them <laughs> possibly yeah yeah you know uh, what's mad so that thick skin that kind of resilience that you have it's very you know the crossover in bodybuilding is unbelievable mm -hmm. because at the end of the day I mean the, I mean I've never compete but the way I would look at people who compete and stuff you've got to back yourself so much because ultimately it's just someone's you know, it's so subjective. It's yeah. up to them on the day. Yeah, yeah. If you fit the part on that particular day, whether they're in a good mood or not, there's mm. so many variables which play into that. And it's the same as in business as well. There's no mm. guarantee whether you're going to do well. And it's like, mm. you've got to back yourself so much. And what's interesting to me, where did you get that mindset from in terms of I want to back myself? Because I believe I've got that. Yeah. Um, someone asked me a bit of advice the other day. I said, look, I'm just starting in the content creation mm. game. Um, I really want to do something similar to you in the gyms, mm. up and down and this, that, and the other. I said, look, he said, have you got any words of advice? I said, mm back yourself because there's going to be a shitload of times when no one else does yeah. and i think that's the main thing because there's been a there's been there's been thousands of times when things have just went shit for me mm. and it's a case of okay i can't get a nine to five job tomorrow because mm. my dreams are burnt out then so what give you that do you think bodybuilding's played played its part i think it, it, so bodybuilding was definitely a helpful thing because it teaches you you know i always say to people uh take the best out of bodybuilding don't let bodybuilding take the best out of you and um you know, and what I meant by that is if you take the application of consistent effort over a long period of time, discipline, determination, dedication, resilience, overcoming, all those sort of things, those are the same skill sets that will help you in anything in life. And bodybuilding was just one way of, of developing that, that process, which was, you know, you try, you fail, you try again, you fail again, you try again, you succeed, and then you learn, you adapt, you can keep it, you know, refining and improving as well. So it was just applying that same mindset to, to business and, and and also, sometimes the temptation you see it with bodybuilding, which is someone says, "Oh, I, I, you know, it's a bad decision of judges, or I deserve to win, or whatever," and they didn't deserve to win. Yeah, um, was seeking feedback from people who could be really honest with you and say, "Actually, you didn't deserve to win, but what you need to improve is this." And if you go away and do that, then that's how you're going to get better. And I would do the same with business or with my development. Uh, you know, so when I first started working at F First Direct, 
um, we had a sales thing the first month I came flat last. Mm -hmm. uh, but I knew I needed to learn. And so then I was like, right, okay, well, I'm going to sit around the best people who are good at sales. I'm going to look at what I need to do better. I'm going to test things and refine and so on. And then with a few, with a few months, I was right up there in the kind of top 25%. A few, you know, a year later, I was the top salesperson in, in the in the company with what I did. But but um, it's also just not expecting instant success because again, that's another yeah, current current sort of issue is people thinking, oh, um, I try it and then you know you see it in bodybuilding. I, I'm going to have my pro card next year. I've only started training a month ago. You know, yeah, you it's a long time, yeah, I? Yeah. So which is and I think it also means more when you've had to work for it and you've 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 got to a point where actually it's taken a long period of time, but you finally achieve it. Yeah. Um, so you know, patience and and uh, is a huge part of that too. A hundred percent. Do you know what what it was just it just sprung me mind there. So for instance, like with 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 my business mate i've been creating content for about 13 years now mm. um, and only say the last four have i made money out of it yeah. um and i think that's the other thing as well a lot of people want to pick up a camera and think they're a bit like the bodybuilding i want to just start training i want to yeah. i want to do this that and the other and i want to get to a certain stage but th it's it's why because i was doing this for years and years and years mm. when i was doing it for free mm. are you going to quit everything for years and years and years to be a bodybuilder to compete in 10 years time yeah I, I don't know i don't know if they are and i think that's the thing i think people see instagram people see you know i'm shredded now my engagement's going to go up and I, and I think they're chasing that not that trophy, do you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever it is. And um, what was your reason for bodybuilding? So for, for me, it was, the, it was the ultimate challenge. I had a vision of what I wanted to look like and I wanted to fulfill that. And I felt I had the potential to do it. But also um, because I knew I had a finite amount of time to do that, you know, there's, a, there's only so long your body will react in the way you want it to do. So I thought, well, actually I'd take this opportunity. And I felt I could I could achieve something and be a champion uh, in it. So um, it was really a kind of, a, 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 I had a point to prove to myself. I think the internal motivation is much more powerful than the external one. So if I'm motivated by whether someone likes my post or not, that's fleeting. It's here yeah, and gone. You know, 20 minutes later, it's out of the window. Whereas if I'm motivated by what I, what I want or need for myself, well, actually, that's a, that lasts a lifetime. Yeah. And so it's finding those internal reasons, the purpose and the passion um, that, that kind of can continue to motivate me. And I, I and until I knew I fulfilled what I set out to do, I wasn't going to stop. When do you think you can get to a point in business and success? when you can treat yourself because i've seen you with a rolls royce and i've seen you in the cars and i know you travel around the world a lot and stuff when do you think you get to a point where actually do you know what i deserve something yeah. or do you think that just becomes it's either in you like were you the type who would go and buy something when you couldn't afford it yeah. were you the, do, how how are you that way yeah so i think there's a discipline to, to this uh, and you know i don't put anything about my kind of um personal life on social media because I, I also I, I don't think it's appropriate to rub it in people's faces it's just not my style if mm -hmm. people know they know and if they don't they, 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 that's, that's fine the um but to answer your question i suppose i think it's best when you can spend uh, on luxury items out of income not out of capital um, because that's something that you can replicate and also having a discipline so one of the things i would say to people in business was leave a third of your money aside for tax a third of it should be reinvested in the business to help your business grow and the other third is for you to spend now what you often see is people spending 100 percent of what comes in and they, yeah. don't, they don't, haven't saved the tax money up and then they've got the stress to kind of build that up later on. But but if they have saved that up, they're spending the other 66.6% um, on themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, how is your business going to grow if you don't reinvest in it? Um, so then if I felt, well, actually, there was from that remaining third, there was enough to be able to do a few things to enjoy myself, then great. But I was always more for, for setting little goals along the way of, oh, okay, actually, if I can get my income to this level, then I can treat myself and upgrade my car or take a nice holiday or do something. So then that became a motivating factor rather than just, well, I just deserve it, which is can be the attitude, you know, and sort of thing. So, of course. Uh, so then it was, okay, well, actually, can I f comfortably afford it without um, shortchanging myself? And, and sadly, I think, one of the there's a lot of positives to social media. I'm not I'm not negative on social media, but one of the things it has made people do is overspend to try and keep up with the Joneses and and yeah. and they're, they're, they're renting cars they can't afford or they're, they're doing they're going places and popping bottles in, in with credit card money and stuff, and and that's that's not good. Have you ever done that? No, I've never done it. Mm -hmm. But just also because I mean, <laughs> first of all, by the time when I was. I don't think I was popping bottles. I was probably opening cans of cider. But uh, <laughs> when I was doing that, it was before pre-social media. But also, that's just not my style, as you probably know from the st seeing the stuff you put out. Yeah, so, of course. Um, but there has been things where I've spent money on silly things, you know, like I bought clothes I didn't need when I was younger and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And you think, but you have to do that almost to realize that was a waste of money. I shouldn't do it again. Yeah, of course. But it goes back to my point about learning quick yeah. uh, and, and so on as well. Um, and I think it's much more impressive when you see someone who actually quietly is just saving some money, reinvesting, building a business or 
you know, buying some rental properties or doing some other things with it, quietly getting about the business. Um, and you might know they're doing well, but you know they're not shouting about anything. Do you know actually, what's mad, cool. mate? I actually know some very, very wealthy men um, and women, but the men in particular who, who I know, um, I mean, one of them's got a Passat. Mm. That's what he drives, a Passat. He's, yeah. he's got a lot of money, mm. um, but you'd never, ever know it. But that's, that, again, that's his style. I think... Whether that comes from the fact that he's not from the social media generation, if yeah. you like, uh, maybe he's kind of he never he was never introduced that world, mm. so he's kind of mixed that missed that flex point, yeah. if you like. Um, but I do think you're right; people are just doing things for the wrong reasons. Um, when it comes to businessmen and people getting into business and stuff mm. like that, can you can you identify a couple of things that someone would need to have where you think actually he could be successful here? Is there anything where you think this guy needs to have that or you've spotted it? Or Yeah, and that's part of what I do when I assess people approach me with companies they want me to invest in. And sometimes it's time or money or combination of the two. But a big part of what I'm looking at is the, the, the owner of that business or the management team. And I'm thinking, do they have the right attitude? That's the number one. Because if they've got a sh- 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 attitude, yeah. it's just not going to go anywhere. Do they have the work ethic, I would say, is, is right up there. Um, because whatever you do, no matter what anyone tells you, unless you get you know, lucky with um, lottery or crypto or something like that, you know, you, you're you going to have to work really hard for a long period of time. So work ethic uh, and then their ability to be intelligent and resilient uh, and make good decisions uh, is, is a massive factor as well. So you can look at a, a group of attributes. Someone doesn't have to have everything in that, but they have to either have a reasonable amount of them or the willingness and the ability to uh, acknowledge the fact that they need to develop to that. So, some, so one of the questions I'll ask people to do is rate themselves from one to ten in certain categories, right? And then I'll do the same, and I can see, well, is this have they got any uh, have they got self awareness? Because if they if they think, oh, actually, I'm terrible at that, and I agree, well, at least they know they're bad at it and they're willing to change to do it. Whereas if yeah, I think they're terrible enough. at something and actually they think they're amazing at it, they're not going to be responsive to anything that's needed to change to improve their performance. So self awareness is a massive one because then people are open to actually oh, yeah, I'd like some help I'd like to know, you know how to get better at doing this as well so what would you say the red flags are when it comes to hiring stuff um, bad attitude asking questions about so look, we all go to work to get paid but asking questions primarily about money holiday can I get out the door at five you know one minute yeah. past five or doing anything to not be in the business yeah uh, and I think also you can look at CVs and get an idea of look if they've had 16 jobs in the last 12 years there's probably a reason why they haven't stuck it anywhere uh, in terms of that um, and uh, you know getting references is, is, a, is a really good way to to get a, a, an idea of, of someone's character as well so I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you here Charlie okay. right so I've had a lot of jobs um, I have I've had a lot of yeah. jobs um, I've been in sales I've been I've worked at Nissan yeah. Asda Carphone Warehouse all these type yeah. of jobs uh, predominantly sales and, and retail um, before I sort of built business I had a Martin company before yeah. this one and one thing that my partner actually said to me she said yeah, but because she's been in the same job all yeah. her life, which is, and, and to be honest, I wish I could have been more like that. Yeah. Um, but she said, yeah, but at like, least you know what you don't like. Yeah. So where does that come in for you? Because you just said there, so, if you've so, had a lot of jobs, yeah. like so, and maybe it's a red yeah. flag. Well, it, it, you would be a red flag for me, not because I don't think you're a good person, but because you're not going to be a good employee because mm-hmm. you want to work for yourself. You're, you're more of an entrepreneur, aren't you? Mm-hmm. So, so the red flag there is actually this guy has got something. Yeah. So I can think someone's a fantastic individual and I would hire them, but I'd also know that they wouldn't want to work uh, for me now you, you you know you might be a good investment in terms of you know you running your own business and me helping you with that mm-hmm. but you wouldn't be a good employee to come in and work and and right, you know, do that yeah, sort of yeah. thing so um if your question was what makes a good entrepreneur can be a different sort of thing and it might be actually that they've tried lots of different things and they've got experience in different areas as well so different different strokes for different folks on that one that's that's absolutely fair enough so what i want to talk about is ultraflex mm. the gym um i've been all of them they're all unbelievable facilities and i and i I know we said this off camera as well, but I think what Ultraflexers did um, is kind of revolutionised gym culture, especially in the UK. I've been to a lot of gyms around the world, um, but there's nothing quite like an Ultraflex gym. Um, I don't know what it is. I I feel like it's became a a kind of hub for people to go. It's cool to be seen there. Whether they're into fitness or not, I think it's nice to be spotted in and around there. Obviously, you've got barbers in there. You've got, um, you know, aesthetic stuff. You've got some bed places. Um, you've got all the works and, and everything in between. So was that kind of an aim for the start when you started the Ultraflex brand? Or was it a case of let's just build a decent gym and then you've kind of built on it? Yeah, so originally it came from, from I was training with uh, two guys primarily, um, Lee Blackburn and, and, and Mike at the time. And we talked about having a gym and that kind of came out of it. And, and really the, the, 
the the particular moment I I thought about doing it was I went back to train after some family um, elsewhere in the UK. I went to train at a gym near my family, and it was a really fantastic gym called Fully Pumped. Um, and I walked in, and I was like, "Wow, this is this is this is what we should have." You know, I I want a gym like this, but but up in Leeds. And I, it coincided, you know, coincided with when I knew a gym was for sale. And the first gym was supposed to just be one gym not a series of gyms, just a great place to train. And at that time I was really heavily into competing. So it was look, I'll just buy all the best kit that we need to fit out this gym. And as long as it covers its cost, I'm relaxed about whether it makes a lot of money or not. I just really want it to be a great place to train, which I think in re in retrospect was a, a great way to start a business because you're starting it to make it amazing, not starting yeah. it to make money. And you see a lot of gyms where they're trying to cut corners to make money. Well, actually it was started with, look, this is not a uh, commercial venture uh, in, in isolation. This is just, I want it to be a fantastic gym and be like a, you know, a, a really good place where I can progress in, in my c competing. Um, but then it became popular, people started coming, you know, really good feedback on, on the gym. And inevitably people say, well, actually, I live here, you know, it's a shame it's not closer, you know, and, and, a, and a good friend of mine called Russ, uh, he said to me, there's a big opportunity to open a, um, in an area called Normanton, which is between Castleford, Wakefield kind of area of um, south of Leeds. And that, that proved very popular. And then it kind of evolved from there. I thought, oh, actually, maybe there's something bigger here. Uh, that we should do. So what makes, when you said kind of the Normanton area, mm. what makes a particularly good area to put a gym in? I think an area uh, where there isn't already, you know, something that, that's of a high level, um, where there's a big enough catchment area that you've got a lot of potential, uh, you know, members uh, as well. And um, it's sometimes actually helpful to have budget gyms because they become almost feeder clubs. You know, people go to a budget gym, it's yeah. cheap, they get started, but after a while they start to realize there's no atmosphere, the equipment's not necessarily the best quality, and and then they start looking for more, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, budget gyms could be a training wheels, you want to take the training wheels off and ride the bike properly, right, okay, we'll come to an Ultraflex gym and, and, that, and that's where they can move up into a, a, a kind of a new level. And did you take inspiration from anywhere? Because obviously is it like the color scheme, the music, the yeah. fact that it's very bodybuilding-esque, yeah. isn't it? But what's interesting about the gym, even if you're not a, a bodybuilder as mm. such, you still go there to train. I see a lot of people, even in Ultraflex Durham, mm. who are not bodybuilders, they never yeah. want to compete. I'm one of them, I, n yeah. I would never want to compete, but I absolutely love training, I love mm. being in and around the gyms. And there's just a nice vibe about the place. How have you managed to sort of cultivate that atmosphere? Do you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like I do. Uh, I mean, part of the misconception about the gyms is they're full of people who all look like they've just walked off a, a st uh, you know, stage. Yeah. And we've got, a, a f the same as any gym, we've got a real mixed bag of, of people from beginners to really uh, you know, experienced trainers. But the, the main thing was cultivating an environment and a culture that was really friendly, but hardworking and an engaging environment. So that mean, meant filtering out some of the members who perhaps didn't want to make it a place, to, you know, pleasant place to be. Uh, and also then um, part of the way, I, the, the guy who owned um, the Leeds gym before I started was a guy called Martin. And he he was a great example of how to, to run a gym. And Anthony, you know, in Durham is the same way. Yeah. He'd walk in, whether he was having a good day or bad day, he'd smile, he'd say hello, say hello and he'd shake hands with everyone. Yeah. And he was kind of like the really good maitre d' in a restaurant. You know, ah, he made nice. you feel great yeah, being yeah, there. Yeah, of course. And so that's part of the culture we tried to, you know, embed with the staff and with, with everyone in there, which is actually it's a friendly place to train. Everyone acknowledges each other. You get some exceptions, of course, but generally it's, it's a good place to go. There's a good atmosphere as a result of that. Have you had any experiences that you want to try and kind of replicate, if you like. So, for instance, when you said they're like a good restaurant, you know, how have you... Because culture's not something... Again, like, I've met millions of people who... Mm. Well, a lot of people who, who you know, they've got great businesses, mm. but culture's out the window. Yeah. Is that something you think you can learn, or do you think you've actually got to experience great, you know, world-class customer service, world-class environments, mm. atmospheres, yeah. businesses... You know, has that happened to you, or is this something that just organically you want to just make yeah. it amazing? I mean, I mean, as a consumer of various different things, restaurants, you know, gyms, whatever it might be, you know, sometimes when you've had a really good experience, and and sales is a good example of this, you might have um, you might have bought a car off someone that actually you weren't going to buy, but they were made it such a pleasurable experience to deal with them, and they were so good about everything and so helpful, it kind of tips you over the yeah. edge. Conversely, I'm sure you've had bad experiences where you were you kind of almost sold on something, and, then you, uh, and, and you think, actually, I'd buy this from anywhere other than this particular person because they're, they're rude, they're unhelpful, they don't want to know, and you kind of don't want to give them a sale. Um, so, uh, you know, it's thinking about what, I try and think about what's that experience from the point you walk through the door. So part of the advantage we have over a budget gym is you don't come in and you don't punch your code in and there's yeah. no one there. You know, you should see someone, a friendly face, you know, sometimes in many cases will know you by name and might, you know, it's, it's, 
um, that kind of welcome, that, that's your first experience. You walk into the gym, there's good music, there's a good atmosphere, there's lots of people training hard. And, and part of what it does, even if you walk in feeling like, oh, I'm not really feeling up for it today, it starts to build you up to the yeah, point that course. by the time you kind of walked in off the gym floor, uh, you're like, okay, so I'm up for it. And then you start training people around you, training hard, they're looking in great shape and, and all that sort of stuff, or they're, they're really going for it. And then that gets you fired up as well. Uh, yeah. And so it's, it's trying to think of that of that experience of someone walking in uh, and how that how, how you know how that then makes it, oh, like I, I enjoy training here. I want to bring my friends here and for them to experience the same thing. In the same way you'd recommend a great restaurant, if they had really good service and good food, you'd be telling people about it. Yeah, of course. Word of mouth is a great way to build any business. And did you see getting into the gym business, I know you just wanted to make, ideally, want the one gym in Leeds and stuff, um, but when you're kind of developing, you've got gyms all over the place now, the Ultraflex gym, so, you know, did you see this as a money maker? Or did you just see this as a... I, I understand you're yeah. a businessman, yeah. but did you see this as actually... Because I know a lot of people who have who've did little ventures into gyms and stuff, yeah. and a lot of them have said there's no money in gyms. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on that? And did you kind of see it as that was a reason? Uh, initially, no. But then after after time, you think, well, okay, if you're going to invest money and in, in time into it, you want it to make money. Otherwise, you've got an opportunity cost of what could you be doing elsewhere within the, within the time. But a big part of what we tried to do is offer something very different to what's out there. So I felt there was a gap in the market between the budget gyms, which are offering very cheap, but very basic. And it's, you know, on experience level, it's two out of 10, isn't it there? Yeah. But on a price, it's a nine out of 10, a very good value uh, for, 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 um, for people on lower budgets. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got health clubs. So you've got your Bannertines or your David Lloyd, uh, where it's 80 to 150 pounds a month, and you've got a pool and a soul and all that sort of stuff. But there wasn't really much in, in the middle where you're saying, well, actually, look, I'm prepared to pay more than a budget gym for a decent gym, but I don't want to spend £100 a month and I don't need a pool and, a, you know, the other bits and pieces that go with it, a racket, you know, tennis courts. So it's looking, oh, actually, there's a mid-price point there where, for me, if we're charging £10 a month more than a budget gym, it's £2.50 a week, but you're getting something that, that in terms of the experience has gone from a 2 to an 8 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10. Yeah, well, that's of great value for people. Um, so we're not because of that you can actually kind of balance up we're not trying to be the cheapest we're not trying to be super expensive we want to sit in the middle but what we want to do is be the best value pound for pound that you spend in terms of, of actually being in the gym yeah and in terms of that then in, in the gym business did you just find someone who knew everything about it i know you've obviously trained and been in and around gyms and the yeah. environments but still the gym business is still a separate entity to what, yeah. what you'd done before that so did you just think i'm going to find someone who knows everything about this and work with them or did you were like like a bit of a lone wolf, like I just want yeah. to do this. And the first gym I did with my friend Mike, and and we neither of us had run a gym before. We knew people who ran gyms, so we went and talked to them and asked them for their advice and experiences and some some guidance on, on sort of places to start, which was was really helpful. I think that's definitely a good thing to do in any business. Look, why not yeah. go and see someone who's been successful? And whether you agree with everything they say or not, they're probably going to give you a lot of useful and valuable information, and, and get that from three or four different people or more if you can. Um, but I had the generic business skills, understanding how to run businesses, plural. Yeah not specific to the gym industry but some of it was so some of it was sort of finding your way and uh, so you know initially when we opened the first gym we underpriced what we did we saw we sold it too cheap and um so you know we, we should have charged more for what we did but you kind of you don't really know where the yeah. price point is going to be um and you kind of think well i'd rather undershoot than overshoot on the price uh and, and you're trying to charge too much and people don't come and also at that stage no one knew what an ultraflex was so you're trying to educate people it's easy a little bit easier now because people have generally heard or experienced of it if they're in that market mm -hmm. whereas at that time just think oh it's just another gym so trying to you know get people across because what what i've noticed as well ultraflex compared to a lot of other gyms they're very pro social media mm. now i've noticed this when you mentioned like i'm a member of david lloyd as mm. well actually um and a few other gyms um and I kind of I've had my experience around different gyms, and I know a lot of gyms, and they're still they're still great facilities, yeah. but they're not of them. Not a lot of them would li allow you with a camera in there, mm. or you know tripods and stuff. I know Ultraflex yourselves have even removed the bags off the gym floor, which is yeah. great for obviously people manoeuvring and stuff like that. But what was your thought process? Was that a marketing strategy to to, to be very pro social, very let, let people PT, well not PT, but yeah. you know PTs, you know vlog their journeys and yeah. stuff and be part of the Ultraflex brand, or was that just something that you just kind of let happen? No, I mean it, it's it's a it's kind of a cultural thing that I saw. Social media was definitely growing, and that was a great way to market, um, and a much more cost effective way to market than traditional methods. Yeah. Um, you know, gyms used to just mail shot you, and you'd get a you know, kind of, or you get a leaflet and you know through the door saying, "Oh, there's pretty a gym, sure some gyms still do that." Like. Yeah, probably. I know those things don't not work, but the, the, there was there was kind of a more modern way of doing it. So 
making the gyms look good so that they were Instagrammable, you know, that they were sort of things people would want to film. And so we've got some people who will be a member at a budget gym during the week. They won't put anything on the socials. So they will come in on a weekend using Ultraflex yeah, Gym and they'll, put, they'll film a load of content uh, there. So making it that people want it to film in there, but also being open to look, this is this is part of, of the world today. Uh, and so it was a great way for us to get them to show people what the inside of an Ultraflex gym looks like, because the apprehension would be, it's gonna be a real rundown, spit and sawdust kind of gym, hostile environment. And then when actually people saw the clips and they saw actually there's lots of people who look like me in there. There's lots of people who are just training, enjoying it. It looks like a fun place to go and it looks like they've got some really good equipment and lots of it, so I'm not gonna have to wait around. That's what I was gonna say, your equipment, like that's what, for me as well as the environment, that's what's trumping other gyms at the moment mm -hmm. because where are you training legs? It's got to be ultra on it. We, there's no really, no anywhere else you can really train yeah. legs to that level, mm -hmm. even in terms of kit selection. How have you come up with your kit selection? Is it because, again, you've been in around the bodybuilding space so yeah. you kind of know what to get? Or is it a case of we're going to do things that aren't in normal gyms? Like, yeah. how have you come up with that as well? With my experience as a gym user, so I mean, one of the, you mentioned David Lloyd there. I trained briefly at David Lloyd for a period of time, uh, you know, alongside another. And I found that a lot of cardio and not a lot of weight equipment. And the problem was they maybe had 70% cardio, 30% weight. But the, the way people trained had changed and the, those commercial gyms hadn't evolved. They were still buying in way more cardio than they needed, which was great for the person who sold them all the cardio, like a credit yeah. to them, I mean, like, go, you know. But there would be 20 treadmills, three of them being used. There'd be 15 Stairmasters, two of them being used. But then you would find there was one leg press, one leg extension, one chest press, yeah, one bicep curl, and there'd be three people waiting to use the leg press and two people waiting for the leg extension. And you'd end up getting frustrated thinking, I can't do the session I want because I can't get on what I want. So whereas we've flipped it very much on that our equipment is pretty much 85% strength and 15% cardio because, and this is this is true very much for the ladies now, you know, ladies are seeing the benefits of resistance training, they realize it's not gonna make them sort of huge overnight and it's a great way to keep in shape and, and, and um, achieve the, the, the look they want. Uh, so ladies are using a weights kit as much of, if not more than the guys. Yeah, um, I get that. And, and so we were saying, well, actually look, in the, in the gyms now, we have between four and six leg extensions. We'll have in the newest gym is going to have eight leg presses. Uh, sorry, nine, but one in the hardcore area. Yeah. Uh, and, and so then when you go and you're like, all right, we want to get on this. Well, if I can't get on the particular machine I would have used, there's there's three very similar that I can use that are right next to it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and also doing the layout. So this came from seeing some of the American gyms where they were very busy gyms, but they had a clever system where above each area they would have arms or back or legs. So even as a visitor when I was traveling, I could walk in and say, oh, I'm gonna do shoulders today. All the shoulder machines are all down there and they're all spaced in a certain area rather than the machines are all dotted around the gym. And then by the time you finish your shoulder session, you realize there was two really good machines over there that you didn't yeah, even see. Of course, it's all or, grouped, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, you go to use it and someone's on one of the machines and you end up walking around the gym trying to find a spare one, whereas if they're all clumped together. So that's part of how we lay out the gyms, I think it makes it much easier for people when they're training something. And particularly if someone's newer to training where it's daunting, I guess it's scary coming into any gym uh, you know, at all is if we've got everything clumped together where well, you can look and think, oh, well, I want to do some stuff on my chest today. I'll go to that area and I know everything in that area is yeah, going to be exactly. for chest. Uh, and I don't have that kind of apprehension around. I've got to wander around looking like a like a lost child, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out what the hell is going on and where it is as well. So thinking about all those different things that can make it uh, you know, easier to, to, to train. And while I'm on that, what are your personal thoughts on people using cameras in gyms? I'm pretty relaxed about it. I mean, it's like anything, you can abuse or abuse it. Sometimes I think it's excessive, you know, in terms of like, do you need to film 55 minutes of your set? But also then on the other hand, yes. if, it, if, yeah, <laughs> no, if it makes you happy, look, yeah. I knock yourself out. And then yeah. the, the presiding rule for me is, look, if you're not getting in anyone's way and you're not bothering anyone, then I hope, you know, go, go nuts and enjoy it as well. Um, as long, I, I, my guidance for people who take it more seriously is not to let it distract you from your training, but if it's enhancing your training or you, it helps you want to track your progress, then, then great. Uh, and I think it's good that people are, sharing what they're doing, you know, um, it's, it's a big industry, isn't it, particularly for people, you know, looking at how other people are training and getting ideas for exercises and stuff like that as well. Because I've, yeah, sorry. Uh, they, no, they, I mean, the only, so the only thing I generally say is not to use the massive tripods, or if you want to do some, some really big filming, which would involve tripods or lighting rigs, is to do it at like an off-peak time or in a quieter area of the of the gym so you're not disturbing people. But aside from that, look, I think, you know, all, all for it and go for it. Because I think that's, that's what makes, again, it's, it's another thing that's kind of a USP so a lot of the guys obviously you've got the Kuba you've got the Anth builds you've got all these guys in here bodybuilders who are in these gyms certainly a lot of people who go to them gyms are not from that generation of social media mm. but they still became very accepting to it mm. and I think again if you go to another gym or 
a budget gym, whatever. They're very much, no, no cameras, please. Yeah. But at the same time, they've got, I feel like that's when you box yourself in, in mm. a, as a business. Like if you're not, you know, this is what's happening at the moment. Yeah. If you're not with it, you're kind of going to be left in the, yeah. in the, you know, behind. So I think that's probably a bigger success to Ultraflex than what, well, I don't know if, I mean, you, yeah, you're I agree, aware, but yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize how powerful that is as part of a marketing strategy. Yeah, and you're cutting off all the people who would help you market your business because what a great way for these people to show to their friends and family and, and colleagues and everything, look, actually, this is what, you know, I train here, but also you're looking and thinking, oh, this looks like a good look, good place. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm looking for something like that. So, you know, it's just eyes on the product. That's the key with marketing, isn't it? Getting, getting eyes on your product and getting it there cost effectively. The people are doing it for us for free. So we're not having to pay them to go and market. Whereas in any other, in traditional marketing, if you want someone to send some leaflets out, they're going to charge All you right. to make the leaflets, they're going to charge you to deliver them or post them or whatever. Or so billboards, it, radio, yeah, any so of that type of stuff. It's a very cost effective way to do it. Uh, a lot of these guys and girls are in, uh, we're either, either in great shape or they've got some great transitional stories of how they started off. We had one guy, I think he lost nearly nine stone and he documented his progress all the way through that. And it was fantastic. And I find that stuff really motivational, but also for people out there who are looking at, well, how do I do that? Well, you know, he's a great walking advert for us in terms of, well, look, this is what you can achieve in, in some of our gyms. That's mad that like. Plus, like lost a whole person. Yeah, that is. That <laughs> is. is. How, did you, how did you learn how to get into the marketing oh, side of things? Because obviously you're not from an industry that uh, big on marketing. If anything, it's quite private. Yeah, so before I had the gyms, I didn't have social media at all. I was right. a bit of a dinosaur, so I needed to catch up and learn a little bit. So. I think you've only got about 100 <laughs> posts on your social now. <laughs> yeah, so not a lot. Um, but it, it was... You know, very much kind of bringing myself up to speed, trying to learn initially just watching how it all worked and kind of what the rules were and the do's and don'ts and, and not make, you know, making sure you didn't kind of say or do the wrong thing and, and so on as well. I didn't want to be the, the grandparent who kind of accidentally sends you a message that they think is private. It's actually just to kind of <laughs> on your post on your wall or whatever or, right. or, or, or in, your, in your thing. So, so learning from that. And, and also you start to watch how other people are using it and who's, again, the same theme of who's doing it well, who's doing it badly, what kind of responses do people get, who's managed to gather a, a big following and probably why are, they, why are they getting that as well. One of the things I, want to, I picked up on, Charlie, when we were speaking there, you mentioned about kind of potential red flags in, in certain people when you said um, if they're after the money or, or whatever, they want to know about how much the money is and things like that. Um, and the fact that you also said, you know, with the gyms and stuff, if it's not really making money, it doesn't really make sense type of thing. Mm. You know, you're, not, you're going to lose the opportunity on what else could you have yep. been doing. But what I've noticed is you just want to do things well. You, you're not necessarily chasing money, are you? Mm. Because again, you've said that these are the type of stuff that you probably would kind of swerve. Mm. In terms of business, you want to just make it amazing. Mm. And then that good. Do you think that's the key to success? Just making something it. great as opposed to money. Yeah, and if you look at some really successful businesses, they, they weren't look going out saying, how can we make money on this? They were going to say, how can we make something fantastic? So an example people use a lot is Apple, you know, because people got the phones and the, the MacBooks and all that sort of stuff is, you know, they make a fantastic product, but because it's so good, everyone buys it. So if you could make something that, that's really special and very different to what's out there, then then you'll the financials will come second, secondarily. Yeah, if you just start off with, how can we make this really cheap? How can we make as much money as possible and hope we sell a lot and try and force feed it down people's throats? It's, I don't think it works in the same way. But also, you want to make something that you're proud to be associated with. You know, for the for the gyms, I don't want to be something like, oh, it's all right. I want people to be like, actually, that's an amazing gym. And if they hear that you you kind of work there or you train there or know about it, like, oh, I love it. And and it's the, it's the business of all the businesses I've been involved in. That's the one that I get the best reaction where people are like, oh, I, I, you know, it's great. I've always, even if I haven't been, oh, I really want to go there. I'm looking forward to it. Or I'm going to go when I go here or see my friend or whatever or I went and it was amazing and I'd love it if you did and I get really nice messages from people where they've come in as a, as a visitor and they're like oh if you you know insert name of town but you know if you, if you ever thought about opening here would be you know be amazing yeah so so that's that's part of the buzz of it but because from a commercial point of view that kind of reaction then they'll go away and tell loads of people about it and again it's free marketing for me of course in terms of actually then they're going and telling people you should try this gym it's amazing it's really good they had this they had that and the other so if you can create that reaction in your customers you're gonna the, the, hopefully the profit should follow in time. and it's naturally gonna grow as a brand isn't it yeah, really yeah i want to know about sacrifices you've made mm. to get to this point um do you have a family yep do you yeah, have a family? so yeah so and so me just looking in i didn't know you had a family mm. so they 
again, news. This is why I didn't want to ask you this off camera, yeah. but I didn't actually know you had a family. And mm. um, what what's your family looking like? Yes, yeah, so I've got a little boy. He's four. Right. Uh, yeah, a wife and a dog. Uh, the dog's <laughs> just two. So having a four-year-old and a puppy is quite a challenge at the same time, as you can imagine. And they wind each other up as well, which is... Uh, uh, <laughs> you kind of want them to be enthusiastic and enjoy things, but they, they, they kind of work each other up. The dog's great for cardio because he needs walking twice a day as well. Uh, <sighs> but I'm very lucky to have a very special family. And... Um, I mean, you, you, I think you're kind of talking about sacrifices, which is, uh, you know, I'm prepared to make a lot of sacrifice and work really hard for their benefit. Yeah. Uh, and the reality is I've had to work six or seven days a week for 15 plus years to get to a degree of success. And that's, again, the other inconvenient truth about all of this. I'd love to say there was a magic formula where you do yeah. the, the, what was it, the five hour work week and you sit back and watch the cash roll in. And if you get very, very, very lucky that can happen but the chances are much more likely that you get struck by lightning or hit by a bus so you know the, the reality is you're just working hard for a sustained period of time and, and you know in the build-up to this new gym opening i've been going on on a weekend and moving equipment around on a pallet for eight hours moving it by hand and putting it in position and why do you do that in containers uh, because from a point of view there's certain bits that um just need me to do it and there's other bits which is a kind of a point of principle of of me being prepared to to get my hands dirty and and not telling others to do things i wouldn't do myself uh but it also helps me understand how much work is actually involved in that and i'm not saying i'm always gonna gonna do that with every gym in the future otherwise i'd probably be uh, battered and broken but it's it's part of a thing of i've got you know i've got a strong work ethic and i believe in in, in making the most of the opportunities you presented with uh and i'm always worried about you know get complacent you know there's a there's a great book about it's called hunger in paradise is is not getting to the point where you get complacent and you take your foot off the gas and and, and other things like that as well because that's the thing I, I see you in and around the gyms up and down the country all the time mm. and and i know how hard you work and obviously you're in the office today for mm. instance and how do you balance everything or, or what's your thoughts on balance because a lot of people say um you know you work life balance now for me i heard a quote it was by alex hamosi i think mm. he said and he came up with something I agree with. And what he said was, was when people tell you that you need a balance, right? Mm. They're effectively telling you to stop doing the thing you love. Because mm. for me, I know that I definitely am more work than anything else. I know yeah. I am. I could be, it could be 11 o'clock at night. I mean, I've got a one, one year old mm. and I'm also always dying to get on the laptop, start mm. getting some work done. Because I know that at the end of the day, when you work for yourself, you don't know when your next paycheck's mm. going to come effectively. Yeah. So it's a case of building a business. How can we build it? What we're doing? We need more people. We need to do this. We've got jobs coming mm. up. So you're constantly in that hunt mode. Well, that's the way I feel. Yeah. So it's very hard to switch off. Does Charlie switch off? I find it hard to, but I can do. And I think one of the things I learned over the years was it's much better to have an on-off switch rather than a dimmer switch. And what I mean by that is it's easy to graze emails, browse messages, is I'm either working or I'm not working, but I'm not like relaxing, then I'll dip into my messages, relaxing, then I'll quick, scan a quick email. So I'm either in a, in a full work mode or, or not, because otherwise you end up where you're never really off duty uh, and you're actually not very effective in either. How did you come up with that? Did, did you? Just through, through, through trial and error, really, and realizing that I was, I would spend all my time just grazing my emails or looking at messages, keeping an eye on things, which was no look, leave them all, do them in one big batch, step away, go and do other things, and, and being present. Uh, you know, if it, I suppose I'd compartmentalize things into family and friends, uh, training and business, and you can give yourself a score at one out of 10, you know, in, in each of those, but at certain points, you know, the business was definitely too high on that, and other things was, would suffer, or the training was too high, and other things would suffer. So you think, well, actually, I, sh I need to try and get a fairly even score within those, but in order for that to happen, when I'm training, I can't be training and checking my messages and reading emails. Yeah, I need to be fully focused on the training. In the same way, when I'm working, I can't be, you know, sent, you know, ch checking group WhatsApps and looking at, you know, gifts or whatever and <laughs> memes and stuff like that. I, I love a good meme, but you know, not <laughs> in that moment. You, like, so, and the same like... with, with, with your family. Actually, you should focus on being in your family. So, yeah. I think quality over quantity is much more important. If you have an hour of really good family time a day, that's much better than three hours where you're kind of there but but not, not really there, present. Not present. You yeah. know, you know, you, you, you're looking at messages or you're dealing with something else or your mind's not somewhere. So having that kind of discipline of, of, of having time allocated for those things and then doing them properly and not letting things blur because otherwise you end up where you kind of, you, you're doing a bit of everything all the time and it, and it blends, blends together and doesn't work as well. The other thing I wanted to ask you, again, I think a lot of people who are watching or listening will, will find this interesting. 
Has success changed you in any way? Because obviously you're not from money, are you? You've, no. you've worked up and, yeah. you know, you're living in shared accommodation mm. and you're bodybuilding. And I know when you're bodybuilding, you know, you're skinned yeah. a lot of the time. Yeah. You, you, literally, that's what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, as you say, it's either a full-time job or nothing. Has it changed you? And can you remember a point when it started to change you if it did? I don't think, I mean, hopefully people wouldn't feel like I come across any differently. I'm, I'm more... I would say over time I've become more confident and more relaxed about things because you know some success behind you helps you get to that point. But also hopefully people people would find me always friendly and approachable. I'll chat to everyone in the gym that I see, and it, you know I still smile, say hello to everyone. Sometimes people just ignore me, cheeky bastards. But <laughs> but you know you know I, I always kind of take the attitude of being super friendly and, and outgoing and all that sort of thing with people, mm-hmm. um, and also because. I think you know I've always admired people who remained humble in, with success and remained hardworking as a, as a result. Um, so you know it's changed me. I think in mainly positive ways. You, it's easy with with time to get cynical or get reclusive or other sort of things like that as well. I just try and take it take a view of actually I'm, I'm blessed to have the opportunities. I've 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 been fortunate because I've had some breaks, but I, I made the most of the ones that I had. Um, and then try and also, you know, part of the reason I, I, touched, I talked to you off camera before about mentoring was, you know, pass some stuff on to people. You know, if I can help people with things, I'll always, I'll always do that. You know, whether that be my time or my advice or just introducing them to someone that they yeah. could they could benefit from dealing with as well. Because I know I really benefited from and still do from from people who do the same with me. Yeah, I know. I was I was actually telling uh, Kurt on the way down here that I remember the time when I asked for a meeting with you. Remember in Ultraflex yeah. in New York, and you give us your time and that, and I appreciate that, mate. Like, and I think that does go a long way. You do remember that. Yeah. I'll always remember that. Yeah. And like I do with anyone else who gives us their time, and I'd like yeah. to think that I can do the same for them as well. Yeah. Um, with the sacrifices and stuff, like, did you feel before you said like I need an hour with my family mm. or I need mm. this? Did you feel like an elbow on the ribs off your wife or or work was like Charlie? We're gonna always hear. <laughs> like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Did you ever feel you that? Can, or was it? Yeah, you can just see certain things where you think actually that's not as good as it should be, and you know, either, you know, it's either your training or your business or your personal life can suffer if you're not giving it the attention that it needs. Um, and you can use a really simple analogy: if you've got three pots with three flowers in it, if you're not watering each a bit, you can start to see where some of them will. And some of them you can be revived with a bit more water and a bit more attention. And some of them, if you leave them too long, they'll die. Uh, and sadly, you see that a lot with, with people who compete where the personal relationships suffer because they're so focused on training and competitions and so on. They neglect their personal life or they neglect their career. And then those two things really die off. Um, and it takes a long time to bring them back or you have to start from scratch and put another seed in your bowl and grow it. Whereas if you try and you know balance your time, you can still have the focus on what you really love but then still have enough time to, to, to and, and quality time to make those other things really Because really that's crazy, because you've, you've clearly applied yourself fully. I mean, you went from bodybuilding to business to mm. multiple business, venture capitalist, mm. you travel the world, you do you do the things you're doing. Like, you must have took a hit along the way because I don't know how you've managed to get a wife, a dog, and a kid. Yeah. Like, that's mad. And again, that's like, even that in itself is, is crazy. Mm. Um, have you lost friends and people along the way? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I've had different relationships that have had ups and downs and, and other things like that as well, which, you know, some of it was my fault, some of it was with other other circumstances as well. But I always try and reflect and think I could I could dwell on what they did wrong. I could always have to dwell on what I did, did wrong in those scenarios as well. But you, you do lose some people along the way. I think it's interesting when you start off, um, I was talking to a good friend of mine, Liam, about this in, in part of his development. When you start off, everyone's generally happy for you because you, you're just doing nothing. So what's wrong, what, what, what what's for them to be upset about. And then as you start to succeed, people, some people are really happy for you and some people don't like it at all. And it's harder for people who start off at a similar level alongside you sometimes to accept you moving forward because mm-hmm. you become a constant reminder to them of their lack of progress. Yeah. If you meet someone and, they're, and you're already 10 paces ahead of them, well, they're kind of relaxed about that because I've met you uh, that's what that's the, how they started to know you but if you st- and particularly if you started off behind them and you start to go past them not in every case but sometimes people can get really uncomfortable with that because yeah, it's a mirror isn't it because even if they don't realize it subconsciously you're holding a mirror up to themselves in terms of well you could have done this in fact you could have done even more and you started ahead of me and you've still fallen behind mm-hmm. so that can make some people really unconscious but the behavior reaction can come out in all sorts of weird and we've gone down a whole psychological tangent here and oh. we can come out in all sorts of weird sort of ways yeah, yeah, of and sometimes they'll just find a reason to fall out with you or they'll just start to distance themselves whatever conversely some people who you, who you think might not be so pleased for you can be delighted and be nothing but you know yeah, helpful and, and and pleased for you in, in your successes as well is there anyone who you've looked at and you thought 
fuck, I'm not doing now compared to them, and they were around the oh, same level as me. Yeah, and look, I, you know, as much as I feel like I've had a degree of success, I'm not Elon Musk, you know, I'm not, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, there's yeah. other people out there who've done a lot better, and, and I was am inspired by that rather than be jealous by it. But, but very, very early on in my kind of, kind of, in my life, it's easy to start off with a kind of jealous, hateful attitude of, oh, I don't like them, and they're so-and-so, and I bet they're this and that. And they realize over time that's a really bad attitude to have, which is actually, in fact, you know, was, oh, I'm really impressed to see them do that, and I'd love to know how they did it, and, um, you know, it's inspiring to see that sort of stuff as well. So changing the attitude around. So I'm still inspired by those type of people. We see them having a, a tremendous amount of success. Because I'm conscious of having a balance between those three things, I might not necessarily want to be, you know, Elon Musk phenomenal, I use him as an example. I'm not sure I want to be sleeping on the factory floor and working yeah, you know, 18 course, hour exactly. days, but you can only but admire his, 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 you know, his business skills. It doesn't necessarily mean you want to go and try and do exactly the same thing, but you can just look at that and think, well, that's, that's inspirational, that's phenomenal. And the same with people with success in competitions or where you can see they've got fantastic family lives and, and so on as well. Do you think having success gets you in the room with, with more decision makers, more people, more, you know, people who are making power moves, if you like? Because I think that's the other thing as well, whether, whether, whether it's, whether I, when I was younger, I was over ambitious, mm. but when I was say, 18, 19, I had a, a different business, um, and I was like, and I wasn't making any money at mm-hmm. all. It was, it was a community interest company, actually. Yeah. Um, and I was building it up and building it up, and I was getting a lot of exposure and people thinking, oh, I just, he's doing all right. But I, I was going back home to my mum's house. I was in my bedroom. Yeah. I wasn't making yeah. fuck all me. <laughs> that, was, that was honestly the reality. Yeah. But I remember at the time thinking, if only I knew that guy, but mm. I can't unless I get to this level of success. Yeah. Whether, whether it is having a particular watch on. But mm. I've noticed as I've kind of getting a bit of success myself and being in and around the guys in Dubai and had meetings and stuff like that, mm. I've noticed that there's a certain calibre of people that will turn their head to you if you've reached a certain level of status. Yeah. Is that something you've experienced? It can be. I mean, certainly it's always going to open some doors for you because people like to be around success. And also at that point, it's easier... Most relationships are value exchange, aren't they? What can I get from you and what can you give to me? Yeah. Implicit or explicitly, that's how, how most of life works. But if they have deemed that, that you've had a degree of success, well, maybe there's something they can learn from you or maybe there's something that you can introduce to them or there's, there's some, some there's, you've got a higher potential for value exchange there. But I don't think it should exclude you in terms of, you know, this, you can go out and approach people. And if you are willing to give up something that, you have that in abundance that they don't have so most commonly time or you just look I, I you know i would approach people sometimes and say look i'd love to have half an hour of your time it'd be really helpful for me but i'll donate some money to a charity of your choice or i'll come and you know if there's anything i can do to help you with you or your business or some people i can put you in touch with you're not just saying i want something from you but i'm not giving you anything back you're saying well actually i want something from you but in return, there's some things I'd like to offer so that it's a value exchange. And that's where I think you can level up quicker because you can go to those people who are saying, well, actually, I'd, you might speak to someone who's got a really successful business. I'd love to promote this. So I'd love to do some thing. And you trade some some time with them yeah, for, for their access to their advice and mentoring in return for you providing some content for them because you've got something really valuable that they really benefit from. See, because I, like, I feel like in a way... I'm getting a cheeky free mentorship session with yourself <laughs> today. Um, can I ask you, just to, from me to you, mate, what was the reason you want to jump on this podcast with me today? So we'd obviously had some meetings before and, um, you know, you'd reached out and asked for some help and we set some stuff up for you at the York Gym and other bits and pieces. We've yeah. met a couple of times at Durham. I always like to kind of meet and deal with someone and, and um, that consistency of experience over a period of time, it's not like we've just had oh, one yeah, exchange and stuff. You know, we've always kept in touch, sometimes exchange messages or just little bits and pieces. So that's part of the relationship building, isn't it? And um, I can see you're an ambitious guy and you've got a lot to offer. If I can help you and I can help people who, who view your podcast and stuff, well, then great. But it's just nice to be able to, to, to do that. I've had a lot of requests for podcasts. I don't have a lot of time. So I just want to be selective and say, well, actually, look, I want to, you know, I want to give yeah. you, you know, help, help out, hopefully, and provide something that's useful. Um, and then, uh, and you've always been great with stuff with, the, you know, filming in the gyms and with members. So it's a nice way for me to say thank you as well for the, for the bits no, that you do. No, I appreciate that, mate. Really is. Cheers, Charlie. Um, Future for yourself, the businesses, where we're going, I we're taking, I we're getting a hundred ultra flexes. What's happening? Yeah, I need to get the big circular uh, chair, the white cat, you know, all that sort of <laughs> stuff, and the globe in the background. Yeah, I mean, the, the business stuff is really get exciting. The globe out, get the cat out. <laughs> <laughs> no, the cat's getting fed. The um, 
yeah. The future is really exciting. In terms of the business stuff, I think there's a lot of opportunities out, out there. Um, you know, we, as we, I want to make the the, the Ultraflex gyms a national brand and then go international and expand into Europe and elsewhere. Right. Um, but the plan is to build up to to 50 gyms in the UK and spread those out all across the UK. Um, and as I said before, I get loads of messages from people in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Bristol, Bath, you know, wherever it might be. You know, looking for gyms like like this in their area. So I think there's there's, there's opportunities we can we can do all across the UK. Make it a brand name in the same way you've got David Lloyd or Pure Gym or whatever. You know, these companies are brand name in their own category. You have to be a brand name in terms of what we do for for gyms that provide the kind of facilities that, that we and have. And do you well. do you have a plan to exit at any point, or is that just something maybe in the future, or is it no? Yeah. I want to build a gym that I. You know, you want us to have. Hey, look, if if one of if one of the big gyms came along and made us an offer, we couldn't refuse. Of course, we'd look at it. But that's not that's not on the on the agenda, really. I think there's so much more building we can do, and so much more opportunity that we can that we have to to expand before that would be something that they'll ever consider. Also, I think it'd be difficult because I feel like, and this is the same for the guys I partner with. Part of us is in those gyms. You yeah, know, we exactly. built that from scratch. That's a, that's that's our brand and our businesses. So you'd feel like you were selling a bit of yourself. Other businesses sometimes are easier to sell. Where I've had less of an emotional connection with it. But um, I think it would. Be, I kind of pictured the day if I did that, and then I walked in the next day, and they're like, "Oh, you can't beh- come behind the counter," and "Oh, you you know, oh, you know, someone didn't uh, you know have a clue and stuff like that," and you're thinking. Or you saw something wrong. Just you couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. So that would be a painful day, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So that's not that. it's been built up really to 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 expand the brand, but rather for for a sale or something like that. Because I know David Lloyd. That was one of his biggest regrets to put his name on the brand. Yeah. Did you hear that? No, no, I didn't know that. Um, I saw. That's what he said. He said it made it obviously it was a lot harder because he is David Lloyd. Do yeah, you know what I mean? I think yeah. that's one of the things. Um, a, a bit like me, I've came to a point where if I ever wanted to sell what I did, it's, I am the business. So yeah. it's, it's, I've kind of made me sell a bit in yeah. that respect. But at the same time, I feel like without blowing smoke, I feel like the reason people come to the content PT is because of me. Mm. Um, whether that's the skill or just the banner, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing something right, I think. And I think meeting people like yourself and networking and getting out there um, has definitely been massive for me. Mm. Um, just to... You know, to close us up, Charlie. Have you got anything to say to anyone? Maybe the maybe the starting out it doesn't have to be in the fitness industry or anything like that. They're starting out in business, or they've been going for a few years. Things aren't going too well. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you asked me before about how I kind of developed some of the business skills. You know, one thing that you can, it's really cheap and easy to do is read books. So, you know, I I'd rec- definitely recommend look, reading biographies from people who've been successful in business, some business books as well. There's so much stuff out there that you can buy for like five or ten pounds. Yeah. It's ridiculous, and the temptation is to spam YouTube videos. You know, some of those are, those are great, but also you know, get some good business books, read through some of those. You know, you, can, you can learn a lot from others' mistakes that can save you making those same sort of things. Uh, I think find an industry that that's um, that's something that you'll enjoy and that's lucrative, and then go and work with a great company in the industry, learn the ropes, figure out how to do things, and then you know when you feel ready, expect you know kind of move off and do something for yourself uh, as well. But all those lessons we talked about earlier, you know, be, you know, take a view of, I've got to be resilient. It's going to be hard work. If you go into it with those expectations, knowing that's the case, then when those those bumps in the road happen, you're like, yeah, but I, I'm, I've planned for this. Yeah, I know this is going to happen. So if you go into it knowing, uh, you know, I'm going to have to put some time on it. It's not going to happen overnight. I'm going to have some mistakes. I'm going to lose some money. I'm going to lose some time. I'm going to lose some some friends and some employees along the way. But I will get there, and I'm just going to have to be. Uh, relentless in my approach to it then then you've got a great chance of, of, of doing it and and going and speaking to people who've been successful in what you want to do and, and learning from their experiences and, and and then making your own mind up as to how you want to go about it as well it's amazing thank you so much charlie thanks oh, no, a lot for your time mate. No, it's appreciate it thank yeah. you cheers no, no, you